So fictional characters are great. You can affix them with any personality trait that you want, you can project your own experiences onto them, and you can pair them with any other fictional character that you want because they're not real and there's no consequences to your actions when you do any of these things. During quarantine, I found them to be even more appealing than usual because I also don't have to live with them. In an attempt to get away from the people I share a house with, I have decided to devote several hours of my time to looking at fictional characters. Hello darkness, my old friend. This video is the first in a series where I celebrate fictional characters that I feel have either been particularly well written or are just enjoyable fake people. I'll do this by looking at a combination of both objective good character development and also an added sprinkle of subjective character lovability. For our inaugural video, I wanted to spotlight one of my favorite characters from the Netflix show Stranger Things, Lucas Sinclair. This video will be broken into five parts as I look at the five character traits that I believe make Lucas a great character. For our first character trait, we're going to look at the character trait that practically defined Lucas's season one arc, his determination. His introduction to the show is built around his laser focus to find his best friend Will, and how he'll stick to that decision to go after Will come hell or high water. It's no mistake that his first line in the show is, don't be a pussy. Don't be a pussy! Fireball him! It's not only a sentiment that he wants to inspire in his friends, but also a sort of standard that he holds himself to throughout the entirety of the show. The scene at the end of the very first episode does a really good job of illustrating Lucas's determination and how that impacts the dynamic he has with his friends. Earlier in the episode, Mike called Lucas and made plans to go out searching in the woods for Will, despite the fact that both of them are forbidden from leaving their house. When they get to the woods, Lucas and Mike march in immediately, but Dustin is a little bit more apprehensive and says he wants to go back multiple times. Lucas eventually snaps at him and tells him that if he's going to be a baby, he should just go home. It's a very telling interaction. When once Lucas has a plan in place, he's committed to it 100%, even if maybe Dustin is a little bit more cautious. Later, when the boys find Eleven and have to bring her back to Mike's house, Lucas is still so dead set on finishing their original task that he fails to see Eleven's predicament as being a valid setback and gets annoyed at Mike for viewing it as such and letting himself get distracted. You just wanted to leave her out in that storm? Yes, we went out to find Will, not another problem. One thing that I really like about the way his character is written in season one is that even though his strong sense of determination is admirable and a valuable asset to the plot, it also doubles as a character flaw. The positive quality that he has can occasionally go into overdrive and cause him to be unreasonable, dismissive of Elle's predicament, and at times cruel. But all of it is done with the intention of finding Will, and this is the type of nuanced characterization that I love to see. I get so excited when positive qualities double as flaws. But let's look at how his sense of determination evolved from season one to season two. The stakes in season two are initially quite a bit lower for Lucas, as he doesn't have an endangered friend that he needs to rescue. Instead, his new focus is bringing Max into the party. His determination to accomplish this task might seem a little juvenile when you compare it to last season's, but he's faced with a lot of opposition along the way. Mike doesn't want Max in the party, Max's older stepbrother Billy is racist and doesn't want Max interacting with him, and Max wants to know about the events of season one, which Lucas is forbidden from telling her. These obstacles have little to no effect on Lucas. He brushes Mike's concerns aside with a weird amount of certainty that Mike will eventually just get over it. He ignores Billy until Billy attacks him, and when he does, Lucas refuses to listen to him and kicks him in the balls. And when Max doesn't believe him about Eleven or the Upside Down, he immediately goes back to see her the second he has proof. Now season three doesn't make it as easy to pin down where Lucas's sense of determination went because he doesn't carry a solo plotline, but based on the way that season three presented his relationship with Max, it's just one little mistake. I've made hundreds, thousands. Max has dumped me five times. I'm going to say that his sense of determination in season three goes into staying with Max. I'm going to jump into the second trait now because it complements the first trait very well. Lucas's abundant and unfounded confidence. In season one, before the boys venture out to search for Will the second time, Lucas provides a backpack full of weapons and he's dead serious about using them. This is a 12 year old. One of the weapons in the backpack is the infamous wrist rocket, a glorified slingshot that has made an appearance in every season so far and I hope makes an appearance in every season to come even if they have to struggle to get it past customs to get to Russia. This wrist rocket has only ever been helpful two times, and neither times has it been used for its original intention, which, in Lucas's words, was to shoot a monster in the eye and blind it. But if there is something out there, I'm gonna shoot it in the eye and blind it. 
I see the wrist rocket as an extended metaphor for Lucas's unwavering confidence in his ability to protect his friends. Lucas time and time again puts himself in the role of protector with his friend group, and he never once doubts that he'll be able to protect them. In the finale of season one, when the Demogorgon is moving in on him and his friends, the three of them frantically scramble for the wrist rocket, and Lucas starts shooting, with no success. It's a 10-foot monster, and he has a pile of rocks and the upper body strength of a 12-year-old. But Lucas yells, it's not working, as if the wrist rocket itself is defective. He fully expected to be able to protect his friends, and he can't seem to accept it when he's failing. You'd think that after the Wrist Rocket's abysmal failure in Season 1, he'd put it away, but it comes back in Season 2 with an even bolder appearance. When Demodogs are stalking the buyer's home and everybody's inside preparing for them to show up, other characters are loading and pointing guns. Most of the young characters are huddling behind adults with actual weapons, but Lucas steps forward, loading up that wrist rocket once again and even stepping in front of Max. Of course, he's not the only one there that picks some interesting weaponry. Mike grabs a candlestick holder, and Jonathan seems to think that he can kill the monsters by glaring at them, but neither of them seem confident in their ability to make a difference, while Lucas is, once again, confident in this wrist rocket for absolutely no reason at all. This confidence seems to reach its peak in Season 3, which is coincidentally also the season where Lucas Lucas racked up the highest amount of hero moments, the wrist rocket is traveling alongside him all season, physically and emotionally. When Max teases him about hauling a cart full of fireworks out to Starcourt, he encourages her to keep mocking him because he's so confident that he'll have the last laugh. Yeah, we just have to shut it again. And the monster dies. But if not, we always have Lucas's fireworks. Keep mocking my plan, Max. Keep mocking me. I want to hear you say it again because we keep doubting you. When Max is trying to patch up Elle's leg, Lucas dumps all the contents of his backpack on the ground and asks, Does any of this help? And he seems confused when Max tells him no. He even takes it upon himself to give Mike dating advice earlier in the season, even though he and Max have broken up five times over the course of six months. <laughs> this kid's confidence is endless, and no amount of failure seems to drain his supply. With all of this, I would like to point out how this confidence manifests within his friend group. One thing I noticed during the many rewatches I've done of the series is that Lucas never seems to put the confidence in anyone other than himself. In episode 8 of season 1, Mike suggests that Elle try to find Nancy and Jonathan after they have bailed on the kids. Lucas immediately berates Mike for suggesting something so stupid and says, Mike, look at her, and Elle pulls her knees in closer to her chest and tries to disappear. So I goofed up here. While editing, I realized that it's actually Dustin that says that line, but I'm still going to use this moment as evidence because Lucas is in agreement with Dustin for this entire scene. Let's appreciate Dustin for a second, and then let's move on. Lucas can see when Elle is drained and can't go any further, but he doesn't seem to do the same thing for himself. Another example of this that I love is when Lucas is giving a rallying speech in the cabin during episode 7 of season 3, where he says that they can ambush the flayed and, in his words, kick their flayed butts. Max corrects him and says, you mean Elle will kick their flayed butts. And in that moment, Lucas looks perplexed and looks like he wants to say, no, I meant me. The combination of his determination and this confidence is both hilarious and genius to me. It gives you this scrap overconfident preteen that can't weigh more than 120 pounds that consistently tries to play the hero and advance the plot. This makes it so his successes are extremely gratifying to watch and his failures are downright hilarious. Before moving on to the third trait, I'd like to add one more thing. When Lucas saves his friends, and I've counted, he's done it six times, it's all very unceremonious. No one is surprised or overly congratulatory of him because they just know that he always will be there to protect them, no matter how insurmountable the odds seem. And this will lead me right into my next point. Lucas is very outwardly loving towards his friends. Stranger Things is a sci-fi slash missing person slash action series first and a drama second, so unless you're paying attention you might not see this. Lucky for you, I'm obsessed with this show and I basically have the entirety of it stored in my brain, so I can break down all the interactions for you. They're little moments, but they're very telling. Some of the more noticeable moments are him wrapping a blanket around Eleven and rubbing her shoulders in episode seven of season one, him apologizing to Elle and taking full responsibility for being wrong about her, and him telling Elle that he and Dustin talked about her every day when she was gone. <sighs> This is a formal apology to Dustin's character. I'm not sure why I had it in my head that Lucas said that line, because it's definitely Dustin that says it and not him, but once again, both of them are on the same page here, so I'm just going to keep this in. Also, I'd like to take this moment to encourage a prayer circle in the comments for Elle to interact more with Lucas and Dustin in Season 4. Please type your prayers now. 
Some smaller moments I love are him rushing to help up Mike after Troy trips him in Holly Jolly, when he goes to apologize personally to Will in the sauna test even though him and Mike went to apologize to him together in the previous episode, making Dustin a welcome home sign when he crosses Mike's legs for him in the Mallrats episode, and finally the way he holds on to Will in the epilogue scene and you can really see how much Will loves him and depends on him. I'm sure there are moments that I'm forgetting, but for the sake of my time and my sanity, I'm not gonna comb through the entire show to find all of them. Instead, I'm going to move into the biggest piece of evidence that I have for Lucas being a giant sweetheart. Max's arrival in season two sends both Lucas and Dustin into a bit of a tizzy. She's new, she's exciting, she can skateboard, and they're both instantly enamored. They want her to be in the party, but their attempts to get her there are pretty misguided and cringeworthy. You got it! There we go. Stop spying on me, creeps. Well, shit. They are 13 after all. Both of them make a fool of themselves throughout the first couple of episodes, and Lucas earns himself the nickname Stalker, which isn't exactly positive. <clears throat> Hi, Max. I'm Dustin, and th this is... Lucas. Yeah, I know. The Stalkers. Uh, no, 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 no. no. Actually. But throughout all of this, Lucas is able to see that Max, cool factor aside, is just a kid that wants to be accepted and validated and listened to. Her home life sucks and she's just been moved away from her biological dad and the state that she has a lot of fond memories of. He makes an attempt to understand her perspective and when she's ready to open up about what she's going through and how she feels like she's becoming too much like her brother Billy, Lucas listens to her and reassures her and makes her feel valued. Not because she has the top score on a video game or because she can do a kickflip, which based on what we see in season three, she can't. So it's good that he didn't go down that route, but he values her because he knows that she's a good person that's doing her best in the midst of some pretty terrible circumstances. The fourth character trait is one I had a little bit of trouble defining, but I eventually came to the overarching phrase, a true friend. Sometimes the characters that are the most outwardly loving and sweet towards their friends are the ones that tend to get doormatted by the creators. If a character is open about loving and protecting their friends, they must be afraid to call them out on things, right? Not so with Lucas Sinclair. The Duffers bring him very, very close to what that doormat character usually looks like with the way that the party dynamics are laid out though. Lucas is more of a follower and he has no problem being a follower. In fact, he seems to prefer it. The dynamic that's established in season one presents Mike's character as the leader. He comes up with plans and he makes decisions. Lucas, for the most part, is perfectly content to go in whatever direction the party is heading. I have not forgotten about this. We're going to talk about it later. The scene I mentioned earlier is a perfect example of this. Lucas wants to go looking for Will right away, but he doesn't insist that Mike and Dustin do it with him the way that Mike does. Mike tells Lucas that they should search for Will, and Lucas throws himself into the plan without consideration of anything else. In fact, in season two, when Mike is struggling with depression and not being the decisive, occasionally bossy kid that he used to be, a lot of fans speculated that Lucas would sort of usurp that leadership role. And the Duffers fed that inclination in multiple interviews leading up to the season two release. But even though it makes sense for Lucas Lucas to be more of a leader if Mike isn't stepping up, that's not really what happens. When Dustin and Lucas decide to invite Max trick or treating, Dustin tries to call Mike to tell him the plan, but Mike hangs up on him before he can. Lucas asks what they should do, and Dustin says they should stick to their plan, to which Lucas says, Mike's not going to like it. Lucas isn't entirely comfortable with the way that roles in the group have shifted. He appreciates the fact that somebody else is usually calling the shots and that he can just either agree or disagree with the shots after they've been called. And that's where the Duffers distinguish Lucas from the stock friend characters that follow along without question. Lucas is far from a silent participant. Are you out of your mind? Just listen to me. You are out of your mind. Do you actually believe in this crap? This is the best metaphor. Analogy. Because the way you handled this, you're in deep shit. Who cares? I care. He loves his friends unconditionally, but he's very much aware of their flaws and doesn't hesitate to point those flaws out. Mike has a tendency to be bossy, especially in season one. I love the scene in The Disappearance of Will Byers when Mike is on the super calm with Lucas and he clearly forgot to take his nice pills that day because he's ordering Lucas around and not being very nice about it. When Lucas notices Mike getting too bossy, he starts sassing him back. It's Mike. Okay. Hey, it's Lucas. I know it's you. And say over when you're done talking so I know when you're done. Over. I'm done. 
over. It really goes to show how important their relationship is because being too short with people is a character flaw for Mike. It's something that comes up again and again with him, and Lucas sees that in him and doesn't take it lying down. Lucas doesn't tear him down or berate him over it because he loves him and he knows that Mike isn't trying to be a dick, but he gives Mike a tiny taste of his own medicine by sassing him back, and then the conversation continues with Mike no longer harping on Lucas for not staying over. The Dustin equivalent would be Lucas trying to get Dustin to stop doing his weird little roar trill thing. How can Max say no to these? I told you to stop that. I'll see you tomorrow. Dustin can be obnoxious. It's written into his character just as clearly as his clitocranial dysplasia. Lucas knows this, Lucas accepts this, but he doesn't have a problem pointing out when he's being obnoxious because they're friends, and real friends have that sort of banter between them. They're able to poke at the flaws within each other without hurting each other. Lucas can tease, challenge, and mock them, and it all works because they all love him for his honesty, and he's as equally loving as he is mildly confrontational. And I don't want people to think that I'm ignoring Will, he just doesn't make people mad that often, so I don't really have an example for him. Now, you're probably thinking, what about the fight with Mike in season one? He certainly was not a follower then. And you're right, he wasn't, and for good reason. Lucas doesn't mind being more of a follower than a leader, and the reason he doesn't mind is because he always feels listened to. He knows his own worth within the group. His input is valued, whether it's criticism or appreciation. Stranger Things presents this sort of backwards, because in the first season, he doesn't feel listened to because he's not being listened to. That trusting, conversational dynamic doesn't really show up until the end of season season 1 and then season 2 and 3, but showing the contrast to their normal dynamic in season 1 illuminates that trust just as much as it would had they actually shown that dynamic in season 1. Lucas trusts Mike and Dustin to listen to him, and unexpectedly, they're not. Lucas tries one more time to get his point across, and this time he pulls no punches. He calls Mike out for giving too much value to what Elle says, and points out the fact that Mike is being way too complacent with her and it could have some serious consequences for Will if Mike doesn't start demanding more answers from her. And he says a lot of really cruel things to Elle during this scene. And because of that, he doesn't really leave the scene with his image looking better. But even as hard as it is to watch him say hurtful things to the people he loves slash will eventually love, this scene made me respect the writing of his character so much more. He's been pushed too far, the stakes are too high, and he snaps. It feels like a real friendship going through real conflict even though the context is absurd by normal standards. This quality makes Lucas a great character for a writer to have in their toolbox. Lucas can mess with his friends, point out the flaws in his friends, and even have conflicts that will lead to plot-driving ultimatums and explosions, but it won't destroy the fabric of the group. The friendships can stay intact through tiny jabs and major confrontations because brutal honesty is intrinsic to Lucas's character, and friendships can be repaired after major fights because Lucas loves his friends and is willing to work through any conflict that they come across. That said, it wouldn't be a Lucas celebration video if I didn't mention his flair for the dramatics. Trait number five is drama with a capital D. When Mike and Dustin show up to his house to apologize in season one, the scene cuts from them at his front door to them in his living room. Lucas is pacing back and forth and then eventually tells them that he will accept their apology. Okay. I'll shake. The implication that's there then is that Lucas invited both of them inside and then proceeded to pace back and forth for several minutes while they watched and waited for him to either accept or deny their apology. And what's more, neither Mike nor Dustin seem to be surprised by this behavior. It's less of a, what is he doing? Why can't he just talk to us? And more of a, okay, how long is he going to keep doing this for? He eventually has to say something. And based on the way that Mike mutters finally under his breath after Lucas offers to shake, says that Lucas probably drew this out for several several excruciating minutes. Not only that, but a couple episodes earlier, he drops to his knees to mimic Mike proposing to Elle, and this is after Mike has only known Elle for two days. If you love her so much, why don't you marry her? What are you talking about? Mike, seriously? What? You look at her all like, hi Elle, Elle. I love you so much! Would you marry Shut me? up, Lucas. <laughs> you could say that this is just a 12-year-old being 12, but come season two, we still have plenty of melodrama to go around. Some of my personal favorites are him kicking the door to a classroom in while looking for Dart, even though there's absolutely no reason for him to do this, and then this moment. He won't find out. Yeah, but, but if he does. Judgment Day. I truly have no words. And based on the reoccurrences in season three. Max has dumped me five times. But what have I done? Huh? Have I despaired? No. 
I've marched back into battle and I've won her back every single freaking time. I don't think that this particular trait is going anywhere with maturity. You may have noticed that the sun has gone down a bit since I started, so to conclude this video that has taken me all day to script and film, I'd like to just say that Lucas is entertaining, steadfast, and perfect to utilize in a show like Stranger Things. His overconfidence and his determination can get him into all kinds of trouble. His loving nature and his brutal honesty opens the door for lots of great character interactions, and you can't ignore the way that Caleb McLaughlin absolutely brings the drama every time that Lucas has the spotlight. And if you're thinking, hey, what about Lucas's level-headedness and his logical thinking? Those are big parts of his character too. I completely agree with you. I wanted to look at some of the less discussed aspects of his character in this particular video, and I'm also going to be talking about that particular quality in a future video where I break down the unique intellectual strengths of every party member. So if you liked this video, be on the lookout for the next Stranger Things themed video because Lucas will be heavily featured in that one as well. Thank you so much for watching this video. I put out new videos on the second and fourth Monday of every month, so you can always expect new content from me on those days. If there's a different character that you want to see celebrated on this channel, please let me know in the comments and I can try to make that video happen for you. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you again soon.